don't see any hands, brother, you have to see, okay? Uh, our walking companions, and we dealt two weeks ago with rejoicing or joy. And uh, the fact that the Christian life we has been uh, illustrated by the way we walk. And I put the scripture up here, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 1. It says, Furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. So our Christian walk is the way we live. It's how we portray ourselves, how we portray Christ in our life. It's how others see Christ in us. You know, we are the only epistle some people will ever read. And uh, if somebody is looking for help, for hope, and they look at uh, what we call a sourpuss Christian, then are they going to want that kind of Christianity? Someone said that if all you do is joy and rejoice, then that's where the wildfire comes in. There's nothing to stabilize you. And then the second one we dealt with is praying. Pray without ceasing. And we said that it does not mean pray 24 hours a day because you cannot do that. Jesus didn't do that. Uh, but it means, uh, number one, to be in an attitude of prayer uh, when things come upon your mind to pray. But it means not to give up. Not to give up. And we gave you several illustrations. The woman uh, who kept coming before an unjust judge and she wanted to be avenged of her adversaries, and he wouldn't do it. He was unjust, the Bible says. And finally, he took care of it properly and treated her right, to, to, did what the law said, and, uh, and the Bible says that he said, I didn't do it because of you. I did it because I'm tired of you coming back all the time. And uh, so we're to continue. We talked about the friend who was asleep and he had a friend come to his house. And the custom was when somebody comes to your house, you wash their feet, you give them something to drink, something to eat. He didn't have anything to eat. So he goes to a friend who he knows will have something to eat. He knocks on the friend's door and the friend says, I can't come out, we're all asleep. And he kept, keeps knocking. The Bible says he, his importunity. He per, was persistent. And uh, finally, the old man tells him, said, my wife and my children are, are all asleep. And of course, in that day, I mentioned this, that uh, the man would sleep at one end, the wife at the other end, all the children in between. And uh, if they, one of them got up, slept, walk, or just was sneaking out, they would know it. Said, uh, but finally, he got up and gave the man some bread because he was persistent. And we have to be persistent or consistent and not give up on our praying. Now, I think there's a time when you know it's time to stop praying about something. I mentioned my father-in-law and how they had prayed, and my father-in-law told the men of the church, said, we're finished, God's answered the prayer. And he knew that, uh, that that was all they needed to pray. There is a time, but until that time, you continue to pray. We prayed for my dad for over 20 years before he got saved. And uh, don't give up. Don't give up at 19 years. Don't say, I've told this before, but there was a lady in the church down in Franklin, and uh, she was a school teacher, very, very brilliant woman. Uh, her and her husband, both of them were brilliant people, uh, but they was those brilliant people without a lot of common sense. They were good folk. Uh, but boy, one day she'd come to church and she'd say, I'm not praying for my kids anymore. I'm tired of praying for them. Every time I pray for them, they get worse. And I said, well, sister, maybe God's dealing with them and they're just rebelling. And now these weren't kids at home. These were grown kids. And uh, they, these people were in their 60s at that time. I said, don't give up on them. Boy, if she might come back on Wednesday night and say, preacher, I'm praying for my kids again. She said, I saw a glimmer of hope. It's not about what you see. You just keep praying. Uh, and in fact, tonight when we talk about thanks, uh, look on the inside of, our, of your outline there. I think that's where I put that. Oh, no, let me look and see. Now, on the back, I'm sorry, on the back there. God tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. 
Our thankfulness must not be based upon our feelings or our situation. And and our prayers should not be based upon that, nor our joy based upon our feelings or our situation. The foundation for our thankfulness must be the mercy and goodness of God. If we base our thankfulness on circumstances, we'll be disappointed. But if our reason for being thankful to God for His promises, we will be eternally satisfied because Jesus satisfies completely. And I didn't get that last. It didn't kind of run the way I think it should have. I'll probably change those words. Uh, but, But it's not based upon our feelings. Did we see a glimmer of hope and now we're going to pray? No, just keep praying. Pray continually, consistently. Don't give up whether they're showing signs of getting right or whether they're not showing signs of getting right or whether it's getting worse. Just keep praying for them. And then, of course, tonight with thankfulness, back on the front again, uh, with thankfulness, uh, we are to be thankful no matter what the situation is. And uh, down towards the bottom, you see the picture on the right. I know that ship is not large enough. That's a boat. I know it's not large enough to be the ship that the Apostle Paul was in in the book of Acts chapter 17. But you see on the left of that picture, the Apostle Paul gave thanks in a time of You can say storm, you can say troubles, trials, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Verse 35 of Acts 17 says, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Here they are in the midst of this storm. And uh, of course, he tells them, be of good cheer. An angel of God has uh, stood beside me here this night and told me, that, uh, uh, that the uh, ship would be lost, all the stuff would be lost, but not one man's life will be lost. And uh, he, he tells them in a time of trouble, be of good cheer, have a little joy, even when the ship's going down. And have a little joy because God's still in control. But then he t- here, when he tells them to take bread, and this is not communion, this is not the Lord's Supper, I, I, I think it's just after this, they also took meat. And, uh, and that was, of course, for a little strength because they needed strength to be able to uh, get onto the boards, the parts of the ship that would float and that they would be on an island. And, and he tells them all this is going to happen. And then he thanks the Lord. Can you imagine that? With all of that going on, the preacher man says, hey, fellas, he said, let me tell you something. We're going to eat a little bread. Come on, get you some bread, get something to eat. I, I don't know if, if you've been on a ship that's tossed to and fro. I've been in just four and five foot waves, and that was enough for my stomach. I don't know what waves they was facing, but I, you'd, I didn't want anything on my stomach. And, uh, but now they're being told to eat bread, and then in a little bit, they're being told to eat some meat. And, uh, and by the way, thank God during the middle of that. That's amazing. Uh, remember Paul and Silas, they didn't, I don't know that they thanked God, but they praised God. And that's, that's another word that means part of being thankful. Uh, and while they had been beaten and was in prison, you know, in the bad times, it doesn't matter what the times are, we're supposed to thank God. And because he deserves our thank. Now, turn to the back again. We may get to the inside in, in, in a little bit. There's a lot here. Uh, Psalm 136, and you may want to turn to Psalm 136. We'll spend just a little bit of time there. Psalm 136. In verse 1, I've got verses 1 through really the first part of 4, but look at Psalm 136. Verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. And it tells us why. For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, below that on your paper there, I've got list a few of those that are to him. There's some to hims, and we're going to see them in a minute. For his. And you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Uh, There it says, for he is good, uh, for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 2, O give thanks unto the God of gods. You notice the capital G for the God, the real God. 
the little g for the false deities, the false gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Again, for his. Verse 3, O give thanks to the Lord of lords. And uh, he's, he is the Lord in verse number 1. He is the God of gods in verse 2. And he's the Lord of lords in verse number 3. For his mercy endureth forever. You see, the basis of your thanksgiving is not your circumstances. It's for his mercy and for his goodness. That's the basis of our thanksgiving in this chapter. Verse 4, it says, to him. Now, not every verse has a to him, but several of them do from here on down. And that's why I put, uh, I thought I put there how many, yeah, how many uh, to hymns and for his are in Psalm 136. And I don't really want to know the number. I didn't check it out myself. I just want you to see there are many of them. Verse 4, to him. So we're giving thanks to him who alone doeth great wonders for his mercy endureth forever. See, we, the reason for our thanksgiving is not just because we get good things given to us, but it's for His mercy endureth forever. We don't deserve the good things that we get. Now, I know that we're good people. We love the Lord. We try to live a Christian life. Uh, but we still don't deserve the goodness that God gives us. Now, I'm thankful for it. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's just that I know my heart and how dark and, and bad it can be inside. Maybe that's why I say that. Uh, but I don't deserve it. Uh, look at verse number five. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. So we thank him because he made the heavens. Well, we thank him for his mercy endureth forever. Sure, he does things for us and we need to thank him for things. But more than that, it's because his mercy endureth forever. Verse 6, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters, uh, for his mercy endureth forever. Uh, when God stretched out the earth, and of course you go to Genesis 1, there was darkness upon the face of the earth, and the waters were on the face of the deep, it was called, on the face of the earth. And, and God stretched it out to where there was uh, land and, and dry land and, and made it habitable for mankind. The animals get the benefits too, but everything was made for man's benefit. And it's because God's mercy endures forever to him. Uh, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 7, to him that made great lights. And of course, there's more than one great light. Uh, all the stars, there's the sun, the moon that we have suns and moons for other planets and everything else, uh, to him that made great lights for his mercy endureth forever. See, there was light upon the earth before the sun was ever created. I've studied that quite a bit. The Bible tells us that uh, in eternity that Jesus will be the light of heaven. There'll be no need for the sun. There'll be no need for the new, uh, moon because Jesus is the light of heaven. Since Jesus was the one who created the earth, the Bible says all things were created by him. And uh, we find that um, it tells us in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And that means in the beginning when the creation took place, we know that the Word was Jesus, because verse 14 says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the light of this earth before there was ever a sun. I don't understand all of that, but that's what the scripture teaches. And, uh, but he made the sons. Verse 8 says, The son to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. Uh, you say, well, preacher, maybe we need some more sunlight. You know what would happen if we had sunlight 24 hours a day? This earth would be a desert. There has to be a night time. There has to be a time for things to, for the sun to go down to cool off, and, uh, and then there has to be the moon, uh, and I don't know what all it does for the earth. I do know that it, it changes the tides and a lot of other things. Um, you know, uh, just a lot about it scientifically, uh, and it has to be here for us to have the kind of life that we have, 
It goes on, it says, The moon and the stars to rule by night, for His mercy endureth forever. See, all of that that He's done is because of His mercy, and it endures forever. He loves us. You know, one of the reasons to be thankful, and I don't think I put it on the list. Uh, let me make one turn on my page right here on the inside bottom part, and I didn't. I was going to put there where on the first one instead of Jesus saves, we can be thankful for that, but, but that He loves us. I was going to put that His mercy endures forever. I was going to put those two to start it off with, and I think I run out of time and room to put it in there. Uh, but thank the Lord that He knew how to set all of this up. All of creation could not work without the Lord creating it the way He did. And the Bible says, by Him all things consist. That means by Him all things hold together. It's by Him we have gravity. I don't understand all about those two layers, I think they say, of magma, uh, the core of the earth, and then one, I don't know how many miles down, there's another magna core, and uh, that allows the earth to revolve and rotate and do all the things that it does. It creates a magnetic field without which the earth wouldn't work. Uh, if that magnetic field gets too weak, uh, then uh, we're unhealthy and die. If it gets too strong, the same thing. Things don't work the same way. God created it in, in a certain way. He created it to last for as long as it needs to last, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, the Bible's real clear about Him uh, making a new heaven and a new earth for mankind uh, that's gotten saved and born again. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. It's an amazing thing when I see all that. And the Bible tells us all of these things we get because of His mercy, not because we deserve it. His mercy endureth forever. Look at verse 10. He's talking specifically to the children of Israel, but we can make an application to us, to him that smote Egypt in, when they're first born, for His mercy endureth forever. Uh, they, they weren't going to let the children of Israel go. And we know that the Egyptians considered the firstborn to be a type of deity, and only the firstborn could rule and, and do certain things. And, and I understand that, that God has a firstborn choice as well. Uh, the sacrificial lamb had to be a firstborn male, and Jesus was the firstborn. And, and I understand that. I don't know why it's that away, but it was that away. And, uh, but he had to smite, had to put to death. The death angel had to kill the firstborn of every family that did not apply the blood to the doorpost and to the lintel of their, their dwellings, their houses. And, uh, and the Bible says that's the mercy of the Lord that he did that. It was because of that that Pharaoh said, let them go. When they got to the Red Sea, Pharaoh had already changed his mind. And, uh, of course, uh, let's read verse 11 and, and on for a minute. And brought out Israel from among them, for His mercy endureth forever. And uh, with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for His mercy endureth forever. To him which divideth the Red Sea and departs, for His mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through in the midst of it, for His mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for His mercy endureth forever. And I will stop there. Uh, it was God's mercy that caused these tragedies so that Israel could learn who God is, how powerful God is, learn to follow Him. Of course, they didn't do a very good job, uh, but to follow Him through the wilderness. And He's showing His mercy to Israel, but He's judging the other nation. Any nation that attacks Israel... And boy, I heard the other day that uh, our Congress, is it Congress? I don't remember what, uh, wasn't, maybe it wasn't Congress, maybe it was the Senate. Uh, maybe they weren't in Congress, but the Senate voted not to send over a billion dollars to Israel for their Iron Dome. That they've stopped the next money right now, whether or not they can keep it stopped or not. And what I heard about it, of course, is, you know, this Iron Dome is just a defensive weapon. 
They can't hurt anybody with an iron with their iron dome. But our country, our leaders in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure now that I think about it that it was the Senate uh, that did it, and uh, they said, we are not going to send this money. Let They didn't say let the other uh, small countries lob all of those missiles in and kill all the Jews. They didn't say that. But they just as well have done that. If this country forgets that God blesses those that bless Israel, we've got a bigger judgment coming. Every country... When God used a country to judge Israel, and God used different countries uh, to whip Israel, to put them in captivity and do different things so that Israel would wake up and get right, God still judged that country that He used to whip Israel. And God did that for Egypt, and He's going to do it for America if America doesn't wake up. It says, But overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea. That's in verse 16, to which he led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endureth forever. I want you to notice that they didn't wander in the wilderness. He led them in the wilderness. We talk about the wilderness wanderings. And I think there was a book that I had in Bible school when I was in Bible college. I think there was a book about the wilderness wanderings. And our teacher, I remember him saying, he said, the title is wrong. They may have been wondering where are we going next, but God led them, and he gave us this scripture here, that God led them through the wilderness for his mercy endureth forever. Well, when, when everything was going wrong, man, when the serpent started biting, uh, biting them, what happened? God sent the cure. Uh, when they had no good water to drink, what happens? God sent the cure, sent the answer. He led them. He's trying to get Egypt out of them. He's trying to get them to trust Him and believe Him. Boy, He's trying to do that in our lives too. Sometimes when we think, where's God? He's standing right there saying, look up. Trust me. 17, to, uh, to Him which smote great kings, for His mercy endureth forever. Tells a couple of the kings in verse 18. He tells about one. Verse 19, uh, Sihon, a, a king of the Amorites, and then Og, and uh, verse 20, and I think Og was one of the giants. Uh, if I remember right in my study, he was one of the giants that was a king over huge, huge people, and yet he was destroyed, God destroyed him, and the mercy of God is forever. And he gave their land for an inheritance, for his mercy endureth forever. You see, are giving thanks. And that's how this uh, chapter starts. And look at the last verse, 26. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven. Uh, he's called uh, uh, the Lord in uh, verse number one. He's called the God of gods in verse two. He's called the Lord of lords. And now he's called the God of heaven. In verse 26, for his mercy endureth forever. They're all talking about God. They're giving different descriptions of Him. All that He does for us is because of His mercy. That's what our thanksgiving should be based upon. Not, did I get a raise? Well, I'll thank God when we get a raise. But if we're not thanking Him before we get a raise, then I'm not so sure that our thanking Him when we get a raise is genuine. It may be, but I'm not so sure that it is. For His mercy endureth forever. I want you to look on the inside. I want to give you just a couple more things very quickly. On uh, page 2, uh, that's the inside left, uh, there where it's got the yellow box, Daniel gives thanks despite the cost. In Daniel chapter 6, you remember that they had uh, convinced... Uh, all right, who was Pharaoh? Uh, who was the other king? Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, convinced him, the, the others did, that you couldn't pray to anybody but him. What's that? No, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, I think it was. But anyway, he... Um, uh, now, I'll not, until we get that straight, I'll not know. But that's... Uh, what's that? Babylon. The Babylonian, yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, thank you. That's close enough for me. 
Ah, well, when I get something twisting around, trying to figure it out on this side of the brain, that side don't want to work. But anyhow, uh, you know, don't pray to anybody but him. He signed it because they had puffed his ego, his pride, his head was swollen up. He couldn't get a, a 40 gallon Texas cowboy hat on his head. Uh, he was, he was, they wanted him to be God. Yeah, and sure enough, after he did it, Daniel, of course, what did he do? He goes back and he prays. And what did he do? And he thanked God. Knowing what's going to happen, he's going into the den of lions. But you know what? Doesn't matter what the cost is. We're supposed to thank God. Look on the right-hand side uh, towards the top. Jesus gave thanks before there was enough food. When Jesus blessed the food that he was passing out, there wasn't enough of it. But he gave thanks for it even before there was enough. He gave thanks on the way to the cross at the, at the Last Supper. Prayed and gave thanks at the cross, on the way to the cross. And then I put the leper. There were, there were others that we, maybe we could have used, but a leper who the Bible says was a Samaritan. Luke, in Luke 17, verse 12, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him, met him ten men that were lepers. At the bottom there, verse 16, and fell down at his feet. Uh, this is the one that came back. And giving, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Well, if a Samaritan can thank the Lord, we'd ought to be willing to thank the Lord. There's, there's a lot more in there, but I believe those are the things we need to um, you go over tonight. Let me ask, do you have anything to say about uh, what does our scripture tell us? I have to read it off here now that I'm going this far in. In everything, give thanks. Any word about that? Darius. But Darius was then. All right. It was Darius. Anything about and everything give thanks. You see, that's one of our walking companions. That's part of our Christian life. And everything give thanks. 